Well, welcome back to Investor in the Family Radio. This is your host, Brian Bain, and thrilled to be with you as always. I hope you're having a great week. Uh, this week, we're going to be discussing the 1974 letters to shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway. And every single week we do this, David. Oh, oh by the way, David Reyes is back with us, so everyone cheer at home, Yay. in your car, I'm back. <laughs> on your jog, whatever you're doing, you can cheer for David because every episode of David is a better episode. So I'm excited hey, about that. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be back. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. But I realize every time I, I do my intro for this series, I always kind of fumble through what to call it because I'm like, the 1974 letter to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders by Warren Buffett or the Warren Buffett letter shareholders. It's like way too many words and syllables. I need to, <laughs> maybe maybe that's yeah. how you can help me in the future, David. Yeah, you can help me figure out a better way to intro the series. It's almost like, you know, it's kind of like an advice column, but not really, but it's because you're reading letters from someone else and not you, you know, and you're not, <laughs> obviously we're just g- going through these letters, but it, I don't know if we could call it like letters with Brian or something, uh, <laughs> right. something like that, because it's not like people are writing you letters and you're no, answering exactly. Questions. But although that would be pretty, be a pretty fun podcast we could do one day. Yeah, maybe so. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you think that would be cool. I, I think it'd be fun, <laughs> but you know, the idea of someone else wanting to listen to it what I have to say. And so I was like, are you sure about that? Are you sure yeah, about that? Yeah. Um, Let's stick with Warren today. <laughs> well, we, yeah, when everyone's listening to this for you, David, we all know that. Oh, right. And right, all right. the fan mail you're receiving, it's just yes. clear that you are everyone's favorite. So of course I just asked, I asked the questions maybe that people are too embarrassed to, to ask you, Brian, you know, I just, <laughs> I just want to add, you know, I'm kind of coming in this blindly. And so I appreciate you bringing me on to, to be that blind person right there. <laughs> well, man, well, I don't view it that way, but I'm I'm glad I'm glad you're benefiting from it for sure. It's it's been a lot yeah. of fun. And man, I totally had something I was gonna say a while ago that in my mind was awesome and I can't remember what it was. So we're gonna just move <laughs> forward. And um and so yeah, let's we're just gonna jump in like we have been. And again, the idea behind going through these letters is we want to learn from how Warren Buffett built his business, which is called Berkshire Hathaway for anyone who doesn't know. And yeah. these annual letters are a great way to see what did he do? From year to year, what decisions did they make? How do they handle problems, successes, all that kind of stuff? So we can then learn from that and begin building, like I say, like building our own, building our own Berkshire Hathaway and viewing our own household as a business. How can we run our household like a good business and grow it? And as we have extra capital, invest that well to just kind of basically grow, grow our financial wealth. And so we're going to figure out how did Warren Buffett do it? What can we learn from that to do ourselves? And then the other component is to just help us kind of just just as an ongoing renewal and reminder for us to be on guard against all the different landmines that we can step on as investors, you know, falling prey to fear, greed, impatience, and any number of other things that hopefully this podcast, our goal is to help just kind of keep us on track. So we're going to, we're going to say a lot of the same stuff over and over again, because we need to hear it. I need to hear it. And I know that you need to hear it. I'm pointing at my computer screen pretending like it's your face, David, and anyone else <laughs> yeah. listening. I'm pointing at you like Uncle Sam. You need to hear it. And so well, and we I all think, struggle And I think stuff. it's good. I think it's, I mean, obviously these these letters, you know, have similar kind of rhythms. You know, every year we're seeing a lot of the similar, you know, just I would say a lot of the similar undertones of just what he's saying. And all I think all, that just kind of goes to serve that, hey, each year there's a, there's a need for, you know, stability there's a need in kind of the message that we're sharing but there's also a need for us to i guess keep the main thing the main thing right absolutely well and and, and kind of just some reminder context for where we are with these letters this is this is the 1974 letter to shareholders and we mentioned last week a little bit the the dynamic that was going on in the 1970s just briefly it was just a tough time economically here in the US coming out of the Vietnam war inflation was rising um, wages were not rising. So there's a big, just financial pinch for most people that this, that phrase stagflation, um, became well known and as awkward as it is. And then OPEC, there's like a big oil embargo in the seventies. All that climate is kind of like where we are for this letter and the next few letters. So, and, and honestly, this is where we're getting into Buffett is talking about, Hey, we're kind of having, they're basically having bad years. Relatively speaking, yeah. and again, relatively speaking, he says, he starts out in the 74 letter and talk about, you know, operating results for 1974 were overall unsatisfactory due to the poor performance of our insurance businesses. And for people who've been following us, the insurance businesses have been like his cash cow in the last, since he bought right. them or started them. They have been his like 
Heisman Trophy winner, MVP, whatever you want to say. And now he's like, well, they're kind of performing poorly. And overall, that means their whole business is performing unsatisfactory because of that. Th- th- that said, his annual return was 10.3% for 74, which is the lowest in four years. So, you know, 10.3% is still pretty great. But, yeah. Yeah. That um, it is, again, I, I, I shared this on the last one, but I think just it, the honesty is is helpful because it's it's almost encouraging to know it's like hey warren buffett is not perfect and i think you mentioned it on the last one but just that the mistakes do happen and we can't be i guess blindsided by it too much and so i was glad that you know kind of opening up with the the cold honest truth there well and, and and to me it brings up the the real challenge for myself and all of us as investors as is are we really honest with ourselves Mm. You know, how long we've been investing and yeah. what has a track record actually been? Because most people, you know, I mean, you get busy, you move forward in life and how much of a sit back and really actually pull away and reflect and even more so pull away and reflect on actual data. And so you can look right. back and say, how did I, how did my investment perform in 2017? Was it good? Was right. it bad? Why was it good? Why was it bad? How did I contribute to that? How did I make it worse or whatever else? And just really being honest with ourselves about our performance. And then, you know, the question, one of the great questions I've, I've heard from people, from investors I respect in the past was if, 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 if someone had, basically, if you had hired yourself to manage your money based upon the results you've had, would you fire yourself or do you need to fire yourself basically? And, yeah. and it's like, man, that's kind of a harsh way of thinking about it, but it's true. You know, cause you, you never think I'm going to fire myself, but if, the roles reversed, should you? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. When I think it's easy to, I feel like just in any field or anything, it's easy to coast. You know, it's easy to kind of go through the motions when you feel like it's, you know, you have it down, but then you kind of lose, you could lose focus on not being honest with yourself, not evaluating what you need. And I would imagine that's kind of what, you know, he's having to do with these letters is just kind of really that that evaluation of kind of hey here's the outlook that we're seeing uh and i think a lot of times it's it's tough to look in the mirror uh on anything that we do and just see where but it's it's also important and and i guess this is the reason we need these reminders every single week is because it's it's hard for us to 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 see those ourselves absolutely and and again from me it's just so challenging because, I mean, again, I'm, I'm saying all this stuff. I'm saying it to myself to begin with, and I hope it's helpful for our listeners too. I know it is because I know that, I mean, I've talked to enough people to know that we struggle with a lot of the same things. But man, you know, I, one of the, some of the things I struggle with as an investor in managing my own personal portfolio is, you know, at the end of the end of the day, how do I make investment decisions? Like what actually, determines what goes in my portfolio. Like what is my system and what is my filter? We talked about filters a little bit last week. Then you have a general filter for like making a decision, but you know, what type of investor do I want to be? What type of portfolio do I want to hold as opposed to just investing in any not random, but seemingly random great opportunity that I, I happen to identify. I mean, you could do that, but again, the less rails we have the ride on i feel like the more room there is for us to get off track yeah that's good that's a good point looking at it yeah and 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 so for me i think okay so how well am i being honest with myself about do i what what is my system because every one of us has a system even if you've never Mm -hmm. thought about it or never written it down you have a process or system for how you're doing things and so my question is for you so whatever you're doing right now stop and or take some time soon to write down what is my current process? And it may be embarrassing, it may be undefined, it may be sloppy, or it may be amazing, but right. what is it? And just and just put it down on paper so you can have, again, be honest with yourself. What is my process for investing? And then what have the results been? And then you can say, okay, what needs to change here? Do I need to quote unquote be fired or at least fire my current process and create a new one? And if so, man, just challenging all of us to, to go through the extra time to do that. And some of the reasons I struggle with it is, first of all, it's hard to know, you know, what rules should I go by, of course. Um, the answer is there's lots of different potential options, which makes it even more challenging. But, you know, it's it seems like we don't have enough time to do the research we need to do already and to do what already is required to invest well. 
So that idea of pulling, a, of putting all that on pause, so we can then come back and create a system. It just, it's just like I don't have time for that. But realizing, right. man, if we don't make time for it now, I guarantee you, we're going to regret it years down the road. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you, you on the last one, but just talking about having partnerships and we're talking about, you know, even Warren Buffett calling out on each letter, having people by name that he's calling out saying, Hey, I cannot do this alone. I have these people, but I think that also helps with just self-evaluating too. Cause it's, it's easy to see ourselves in either. I feel like we either, and I think you said this before, I forget the quote, but you either, you know, you, un- we underestimate ourselves a lot or sometimes we overestimate ourselves a lot. And I think having fresh eyes kind of talk through a lot of this stuff with i hope that i think that helps me in a lot of ways kind of evaluate where i'm at well i think one of the 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 greatest values of having an investment advisor is you have someone to to filter your filter you with you know um again obviously there's lots of different advisors out there some of them are amazing some of them aren't and i'm not going to focus on that right now but the idea of having another person that you have to filter your decisions through is just really helpful because, you know, they probably haven't been reading what you've been reading. And so if you're really excited about something or really scared of something and then you run it by them, you kind of have, then you have to kind of defend that investment case. You have to make a case for them. Um, and so that, that's kind of serves as a significant filter for yourself. Another thing you can do is write articles, become an author or a contributor on, on a, a website like Seeking Alpha. I'm a big fan of seekingalpha.com. I've, I've used the website a lot myself and, and, I'm fortunate to be to be a contributor there, and technically it's available. It's open. It's an open source platform, and so the you know I challenge people that before you make one great filter you can have is write out your investment thesis in an article, publish it publicly, and see what feedback you get. You know, and hmm. so at a minimum it challenges us to process through our thoughts in an intelligent way, and then hopefully get some feedback on that as well. And you know it could be scary. You know I know what it's like to publish something and think gosh, I hope I haven't like just said something really foolish that I'm going to get embarrassed by when people call me out on it. But here, here's the thing. <laughs> it all comes, about the, comes, by, comes back to the tone with which we do stuff. And if you write a letter and you're saying, hey, this is my thesis, um, and you say, hey, I, I would love, to, I know I'm not perfect. You know, I, I would love to hear feedback. If, if there's a, a hole in my thinking or a mistake that I've made, you know, on a platform like Seeking Alpha, most people, um, if you are humble in your approach, will most people are going to respond positively to you. And so that reduces that kind of concern a lot. But if you come out and you're, you try to pose yourself as some perfect expert and you try to like sound like you got it all figured out, then you're kind of inviting yourself to get, you know, more significant critique, which isn't very fun. So that's just kind of a little <laughs> thing there because I think that's a great filter. Another thing I want to bring up is the idea of, you know, have you ever considered writing your own annual shareholder letter for your investment business? And again, I'm sure that sounds ridiculous because like, well, I don't have any shareholders. Like, well, you have yourself at a minimum. If you have a family, technically they're shareholders as well. But what if we had a discipline to at least annually write a shareholder letter based upon our investment business, hmm. our portfolio, and just and d- just genuinely be honest? How did it go? You can go position by position if you want to. How did this perform? Why did it perform the way it did? What do I think about it going forward? What changes need to take place? What did I learn this last year? And man, if we took on as investors took on that practice, wow, man, I just I I just can't imagine the positive impact that would have over time with our investments. Well, I think that would be really helpful too, just to kind of it's almost just like a an outline because I feel like I'm really guilty of like I have things in my head and I don't really write a lot of stuff down, uh, and then I get mad at myself for not really like understanding it fully later or like when I when I'm evaluating myself and, and, and anything. But I think that I, I really like that idea. And what was the other website that you were mentioning before? Um, seekingalpha.com. Seeking out. Okay. And so that's just a, a site that people can just publish stuff for that. It's kind of like a massive investing blog, basically. And, you oh, know, cool. and, and, and I mean, it has editors, so you can't just publish anything you want. But, you know, if you create an article, and then you submit it, and then if the editors approve it, you can get it published and stuff. And and and, I, and and again, I just feel like that's just a great way. Even if no one reads it, like the goal of writing it isn't necessarily for people to read it. It's for it's to discipline ourselves to really think through our investments before we actually pull the trigger on it. And because if you can't mm-hmm. if you can't write an intelligent article about it, 
then it's probably not wise to put a meaningful amount of your portfolio in that investment either. Um, but, and then the added benefit is, you know, potentially get some feedback that could either encourage you or maybe cause you to pause a little bit. Maybe they point out uh, something you've missed. That's happened to me before. I've made some, read some articles and people said things. And I was like, Whoa, wow. I didn't think about that. I'm glad, I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad I wrote that article. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that is good. I didn't, I didn't know that that was even out there. I think that's a, that's a great resource. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think it, it, it is a great resource and one that I've benefited from for many years and, and very, very thankful for, for sure. Man, I kind of feel like after that whole writing an annual shareholder letter thing, I feel like I was like, I'm not sure what else can I say in this podcast is going to be as good as that. And that sounds, sounds <laughs> yeah. self-serving, but I just think, man, that, and on, and I'm, and I'm, man, with, with humility admit, I don't do that. And I'm like, I kind of want to stop and write one right now, you know? When, whenever well, there's an earnings season, yeah. like stop and and create your own earnings call or your own report on how your portfolio has done. Um, yeah, you know, one thing I, I, well, I think have, you could go back yeah. to it too. I think you can go back to it and like these letters and look at the the way it grew and the way like you saw things change and your verbiage changed. It's common. I mean, it's just like your. It's like a journal that you can go back exactly. to uh, and look at. So I think that is very helpful so i bet that i mean and you were saying that you you do this i bet you can look back on your previous years and stuff and see how much things have changed for you even in your current situation yeah well yeah it's definitely like a, a benchmarking tool for your growth like just like you're saying and i think but when you you know it's that dynamic of when you put it down on paper whether it be typed or written you're kind of like setting a stake in the ground and i think it just helps us move forward and i imagine you know, you're on a hiking trail and you have like a hiking pole and each year you write your annual letter or, or whenever you write just an investing journal in general, like, which is what I was about to, I'm going to talk about here in a moment as well. It's like you're going up a mountain and you, you kind of ram that in, in, um, hiking pole into the ground and you kind of, you put your weight on it and you're kind of moving yourself forward. Then you put the other one in the ground, you dig it in, you move yourself forward. Each year mm -hmm. we write the annual letter. It's like digging that pole in and moving ourselves <laughs> forward and moving ourselves forward. And it's to have that definitive progress year by year versus if we don't do that, I think it's like you don't have hiking poles and you're just kind of slipping a lot. And you're like, well, I think I've moved forward a little bit, but you know, I kind of keep slipping on the rocks and you know, I'm not, it's just, it's just not as clear of a progress and you're not making as much progress and you're using a lot more, you're spending a lot more energy to make less progress. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. I think that's helpful in that regard. And to add to that, again, just take it to another level is the idea of just adopting an investing journal approach. And what I've and what I'm working on doing right now is I I would like to write an investing journal every week. You know, I mean, obviously, I like I I have a business investing business, so I'm obviously more involved in the space than maybe the average person. So because of that, I want to have a more uh, have. High, a higher recurrence of my entries, if, if that's probably the clumsiest way I could have said it. But I want to write more entries, you know, because yeah. I, I have more stuff in my mind going on that I want to process through. You know, maybe for some people, monthly is enough. It doesn't have, there's not a magic number, but enough that you're processing your, your, what you're learning, processing what you're thinking about doing. That maybe you'll write a, an entry slash article before you actually make an investment, just kind of filter yourself a little bit. Man, I'm, I'm telling you. And man, if you if you do that right now, you're listening, you do that, send me an email. I would love to learn about it. Maybe even have you on the show sometime to talk about it. Uh, email me. You can email at Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at InvestorInTheFamily.com or just mail, M-A-I-L, at InvestorInTheFamily.com. I um, would love to hear about that because that would be, I'd, it'd be fun to, to learn from what our listeners are doing and, uh, and, uh, even encourage them with that too. So anyway, there's, there's that. That's helpful. Yeah, I think uh, I think just a journal of any kind helps me with a lot of things just to think kind of going back to what we've talked about is just thinking long term. I feel like it's helpful to even go back to history books, but also go back to your own personal history of doing things and then let that be a tool to help you go think long term. Whenever those moments come where you're thinking, man, like I want to get out of this or like this is a bad decision or, you know, you're kind of go back to that emotional thing. You're, you're wanting to get out. You can look back on those past things and realize, no, I'm, you know, I may decide to stick it out because of, you know, my track record or because this has happened, things like that. So I feel like that's very helpful in that way too. 
Well, and even now, like I'm looking through my notes here on the 1974 letter, and they all kind of revolve around similar themes because it was it was a hard year for it was it was a it was a hard it was it was a a negative year for Berkshire Hathaway. They had a lot of struggles. I'm I'm looking at the notes, and you know one thing here, like actually part of their big success within their insurance companies actually led to a lot of competition. People wanted to emulate their success. And because they're so successful, a lot of competition came in and led to a lot of like painful years in the investing in, in their insurance industry, their insurance businesses mm-hmm. because of that. Um, I scroll down a little bit further. It talks about, you know, they're going, going through painful times and have to wait it out and make wise financial decisions. Even Buffett and his managers have made the mistake of rushing into an investment without proper due diligence. A painful lesson. Talked about one of their automobile insurance companies. Which one was it? Oh, yeah, it says, our efforts to expand home and autom- automobile insurance company into Florida proved disastrous. I won't, get, I won't get into the details of it, but even Buffett and his managers, you know, they have ventures that don't work out well or maybe yeah. were just bad decisions. He talked about their insurance investment results. A lot of the capital was in bonds and those didn't perform very well. The capital and equities performed poorly and were expected to do so again the next year. And on and on. I mean, like all these negative things in the letter. And again, I think as investors, our, our typical approach is, um, first of all, remember that there's 12 months between every one of these letters. So that's a long time to wait. That's Imagine true. waiting 12 years or tw- 12 months, excuse me, 12 months uh, yeah, between yeah. now, like making an investment and waiting 12 months before you're willing to make a change on that or even years. I remember. Um, in one of the investment summits that I've done and, and, and interviewed a, a really investor that I respect. He talked about don't ever evaluate when your investments in, with less than a three to five year time window. So basically give everything three to five years to play out, which sounds really smart, but how many people like wait, are willing to wait three to five years when you're, it just, it feels like forever. And so we've got to be able to find ways to temper our expectations and to, to, to be patient. Um, because Buffett had a really bad year, but he didn't, they're not jumping ship on any of these businesses. They're like, Hey, we're, we're pressing through, we're moving forward, but man, this is really hard. I think that's a good thing to note too. It's just, is that they're, they weren't jumping ship. I think that's a, that's just a great lesson to be learned here on thing. And I think it's, I feel like today is, is a lot harder with anything to stay, stay constant with it when things get rough, because, our culture, I feel like we've provided so many solutions every which way so we don't have to wait anymore. So things can get done quicker so we can get to places quicker so we can. So I feel like just the narrative is constantly, well, if it's long, let's, there's probably a way that we can get it. If not, let's just jump ship. And so I think that's a pretty good lesson to take from that as well. Well, and to, and to build on that is what that idea is, I mean, the whole idea of credit. I mean, credit allows us to have what we want today. Like, I don't want to wait for to be able to have enough cash to buy a car. I want the car now. Same yeah. with the house. Same with, you know, credit card debt and things like that is, you know, I don't want to wait for it. And I, and I, I mean, and I'm not trying to pick on anyone for any of those dy- dy- dynamics, but it's by and large, it's like, hey, I would rather, I want that thing now as opposed to waiting for it. Yeah. Uh, waiting for when I can pay for it. And so what we're doing is we're stealing from the future basically because mm. we have to so when we make money in the future we can't buy stuff we have to pay people back for that money and that yeah you know, we get, of course that can be a whole other conversation on a national debt perspective of what does it mean to be 20 trillion dollars in debt as a country well i mean eventually either current or future generations are going to have to pay the price for that because eventually you know i mean just the service in that debt becomes overwhelming but that becomes a whole other conversation we have to get into but it reinforces your point we live in a high credit culture which is evidence of the fact that we don't want to wait for things. We want to have them right now, which is a very destructive mindset when it comes to investing. My wife has this uh, quote that she sometimes, I don't even know where she got it from, but she always says, uh, make future self happy. And uh, so, you know, she's always saying that, you know, so awesome. she's always, you know, and it's something simple, but like, even if it's, you know, we're, we're coming home and it's been a long day, but we, no, we have, you know, laundry to fold or dishes to clean or something like that. And all we want to do is just sit on the couch and just kind of be done for the day. We always kind of remind ourselves, okay, like what will make future David happy? You know, it's That's like future so David, great. 
future David will be happy to know that, you know, I can rest and with all that being done. And so that's kind of it. Honestly, it really helps us because we start to think we're like, yeah, we're going to be a lot more. We're going to be in a lot better place if we do all this stuff now. And so I think that could be something that, you know, you could look at even with these journals that you're talking about is think through what would make yourself in a better place. You know, what are you, what could you do now to, make yourself in the long term be in a better state, you know, for you. Well, and, and I mean, that is so good. And I think about something that, you know, we, uh, another thing we say a lot is that every dollar and minute we spend is an investment in something. And it's the whole idea that all of our life is an, is, is, is a string of various investments, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that idea of making my future self happy is, you know, that can apply to our health. Like, Hey, well, I want to, you know, maintain at least a, a moderately reasonable diet so that I can be healthy as an individual in 10 or 15 years. And I want yeah. to have some exercise moderately, you know, at a minimum, I want to get my five to 10, that five to 10,000 steps in today because I want to try to be, I want to be healthy 10 years down the road. And I, <laughs> I even thought the other day, like I was, you know, it's late at night, you going to bed and it's like, man, I, I'm brushing my teeth, but I'm not flossing tonight. I do not want to floss. The next thing you know, it's been like, a week or two, and I'm like, oh, I haven't flossed, and I don't know when last time was I flossed, and I actually thought the other day, Brian, you're making an investment in your teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in 20 years, I don't want to have to like, I don't want to lose my teeth or have bad teeth because I wasn't willing to spend a minute, you know, back in May of 2018 to clean them, you know, and it, it applies right. to all those dynamics. Yeah. So with that being said, we'll we'll wrap things up today with the 74 letter with make future self happy. So that being there said, everyone have a, a great week. David, um, awesome to have you as always. And we'll be back next week with the 1975 um, Berkshire Hathaway letter to shareholders from Warren Buffett because I'm still not sure how to best to say that. <laughs> it's not. Maybe, maybe next week I'll have a better way to do it. We'll see. Come back and yes. see. Thanks, guys. The information and opinions contained on this podcast are for educational purposes only. The information does not consider the economic status or risk profile of any specific person. The information and opinions expressed should not be construed as investment trading advice and does not constitute an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy and sell securities.